Welcome to another episode of Horrible History. Today we're going to be talking about the Donner Party of 1846. This was a group of pioneers that were moving from Springfield, Illinois, all the way to Sutter's Fort in Sacramento. California offered a lot of opportunity for people. This was a chance to start over, maybe new agriculture, or business venture, or mining expedition, or just relocating your family to start over. So the Donner Reed party consisted of George Donner, his wife Tamsin, and their five children, Jacob Donner, his wife Elizabeth, and their seven children, James Reed, his wife Margaret, and their four children. They were also bringing Margaret's mom. And both groups brought along some teamsters. These were people that would drive the animals for the group as they traveled. And some handymen and a cook. So this trip out west typically took four to six months. And you wanted to plan it so you could get over those mountains before snowfall hit. So the James Reed party, they take off in April. And they're doing just great. They go to Independence, Missouri, get there by May. They meet up with the bigger caravan and they start heading out west. Everything's going pretty good so far. During their initial travel out west, they had some great people leading their caravan, such as William Russell or Lilburn Boggs, who was a former governor of Missouri and for some reason was traveling out west because he was afraid of Mormons? Yeah, that's weird. Maybe he just didn't like door-to-door -door solicitors. They were still making pretty good time until about July 31st when they got to Fort Bridger, Wyoming. This is where they learned about a shortcut called Hastings Cutoff. This guy, Lansford Hastings, told the group about a shortcut that would shave off a few hundred miles off of their travel time. What Hastings failed to tell them was that this shortcut went through a mountain range, a canyon, and a desert. Those are kind of big details that you want to tell a group that's traveling with children and women in large wagons with oxen. So what does the group do? They take the shortcut. Things wouldn't really start falling apart until the Donner group started making their own decisions. So they take that turn off to the south at Fort Bridger, Wyoming and start heading toward Hastings Cutoff. They hit the Wasatch Mountains and they have to move boulders and cut down trees and maneuver these tight, narrow spaces to get their wagon and oxen through. It's just a nightmare for traveling in a big group. Once they get through there, they hit the canyons and they're able to move a little quicker so they're out of the canyons, and it's about August 30th. And are they at the Sierra Nevadas yet? Not even close. They still have to go through the Great Salt Lake Desert, which Lansford Hastings told them, hey, it's only a 40 mile desert. Turns out it's 80. Yeah, that's kind of a big detail that you wanna tell people. I don't know, we kinda of need something called water. On the third day, they run out of water. A bunch of the oxen run off, to go find water. What do you need oxen for? To pull those wagons. So they have to abandon a bunch of wagons out there in the middle of the desert. It takes them five days to get through this 80 mile desert that they thought was gonna be 40, but it turns out it was 80. Once they get through the desert, they take about a week long break. They're looking for some of the cattle that ran off. They don't really find anything. And it's kind of frustrating at this point. The Donner Party Park in Reno, Nevada is marked as the last place the Donner Party rested before entering the Sierra Nevada. There's a small monument describing their hardships along with the accidental death of William Pike from a gunshot wound. He is buried somewhere in this area. There is also a trail marker for the Emigrant Trail. Today this area is a sleepy residential area that lives side by side with the memory of the Donner Party. It's kind of weird that it's right in the middle of a neighborhood. But there's no time to sit here and be frustrated. We gotta keep moving. We gotta get to those Sierra Nevadas before the snow starts falling. So the group finally makes it back to where Hastings Cutoff meets back up with the original trail. If they would have just stayed on the original trail, it would have been 125 less miles they traveled. Not to mention all those boulders and trees and all that garbage and running out of water. Hastings Cutoff ended up costing them about two months travel time. Two months is kind of a big deal when you're trying to beat that snow in those Sierra Nevadas. It's early October now and cracks are beginning to form in the group. You can see the frustration coming to the surface. In one incident, 
Some Teamsters get tangled up and James Reed comes over with his knife to try to cut them loose. But one of the Teamsters hits him in the head with a whip handle and it cracks his skull. So what does James Reed do? He pulls out his knife and stabs him in the chest. This man actually ends up dying. Louis Kesselberg, another man traveling in the group with his family, I have a lot more to say about him later, suggests that they should hang James Reed for what he's done. But the rest of the group is like, ah, oh, nah, 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 that sounds a little too harsh. How about we just uh, kick him out of the group? His family can stay, but he's gotta go. So they agree to this. James Reed says, okay. He takes some supplies, says goodbye to his family and that he'll see him at Sutter's Fort, and he takes off. Through October, the group is moving as fast as they can now. They know that cold air is coming in. They gotta hit those Sierra Nevadas before this snow starts falling. It's the end of October, and they finally make it to the base of the Sierra Nevadas. Ah, here we go. George Donner's wagon breaks, and he tells his family, Don't worry guys, I got this. The rest of the group, you guys go on ahead, I'll catch up. He attempts to fix it, cutting his hand pretty severely. This slows the group down, and causes the other group to separate from them. They set up camp, and that night, it snows. Five feet. They aren't going anywhere. They're gonna be stuck here. And unless the snow lets up and it thaws a little bit, they're not getting out of these mountains until spring. They figure the best thing to do is shelter in place. The Donners are a little bit behind because of the broken wagon and have to shelter in place about six miles away. The larger group are ahead over on the east side of Truckee Lake, which is now known as Donner Lake. They find an abandoned cabin, which seems like a godsend, so they just hang out there. The Donner Picnic Ground near Alder Creek is the area where the Donner families actually sheltered in place during that winter of 1846. So I'm at the Donner Picnic area, which most people don't know is the location where the Donner party, who was separated from the rest of the group, because remember their wagon broke, so they were behind everybody else. But this is the actual location that they were said to have camped out for that fateful winter in 1846 into 1847. So we're gonna take this little interactive trail and see what else uh, we can find along the way. All right, let's go. The picnic area offers scenic trails with some beautiful views and small information placards along the route. There were a couple campfire burnout areas with chopped wood. It seemed strange like someone had been camping there. These small campsites remind you that people were once trapped in this location. This is the spot where the Donner party, just the Donner family, had sheltered in place because of their wagon breaking down and they had to stop because of the winter storm. And it was supposed to be this tree that the lean-tos were put up next to and they had to camp out here. This sign was posted on this tree many years ago by historians that had come through the area trying to mark the location where the Donner Party had sheltered. And I think this is the last bit of it that's left. There's really nothing much you can read on it. I think I can kind of see like a D-O-N right here, but it's really hard to make out. And the weather and the winters out here are really brutal. Just down the road a ways lies the Donner Memorial State Park, which commemorates the location where the rest of the Donner Party sheltered. Today there is a small museum telling their story and displaying artifacts from clothing to tools to weapons that really captures the time period. It gives people a greater appreciation and understanding of the pioneer lifestyle. Just outside the museum lies a large monument with a pioneer family standing on top. They are standing atop the 22 foot base, giving visitors an idea of the 15 to 20 foot snow accumulation that takes place on the summit. They are facing west, toward Donner Pass, looking forward and never turning back. So this is actually the spot with the Breens, the Graves, the Murphys, and those other families where they ended up setting up camp because there was a cabin that was built prior to their getting there. So they took that camp and they used that cabin as shelter when it first started to snow, which, I mean, it must have been a godsend when you see that and it starts snowing that hard out here. Next to the monument lies a park, which offers trails and paths through lush greenery, which make it easy to forget how treacherous this location can be in the winter. 
This rock was used as a wall and fireplace for one of the cabins that the Donner Party sheltered in. By this time, James Reed, remember the guy who got exiled for stabbing the guy? He's made it to Sutter's Fort and he knows something's wrong because his family isn't here yet. So he decides to gather some supplies and go out and find them. The snow is too heavy, there is no way he's going to make it to them. Patrick Breen was keeping a journal through this whole ordeal and he writes on November 20th, the group has killed off most of their cattle and they are running low on provisions. He also mentions that it's been snowing for about eight days straight. So you can imagine how much snow is accumulating out there. So most of their oxen are dead, the horses are dead, and they can't reach the carcasses because there's so much snow accumulation that it just buries these animals. Also, this makes it very difficult to get firewood because only certain parts of the trees are showing and the snow keeps climbing up higher and higher. Everything is becoming so difficult for them in this freezing temperature and low food and low provisions and low morale. You also have to remember that the group didn't consist of just the Donner families and the Reed family. There was about 81 people who entered these mountains and got stuck. That's a lot of mouths to feed. So by December, people are dying of illness, exposure, and starvation. They know they have to do something. They fashion together some snowshoes using ox bones and ox hides, and they take 17 of their strongest people and they send them out to get over that summit. This group would later be known as the Forlorn Hope. Two of these people wouldn't be able to keep up and would turn around and go back to camp. One of them was a 10 year old boy, William Murphy. This group of snowshoers would run out of food in about six days. Patrick Dolan would suggest that someone sacrifice themselves to save the others, basically sacrifice yourself so we can eat you. And the group was not too keen on that idea. They said, uh, maybe we should just wait until someone just succumbs to the elements, which wouldn't take long. Four members in the group would quickly succumb to the weather and starvation. One of them was Patrick Dolan. The group would take their bodies, cut out the organs and the muscle and dry them, and they would consume them. They also divvied up portions of the people so that others were not eating their own family members. This was the one bit of humanity that they were trying to maintain. It was recorded that while they were consuming their companions, they averted their faces from each other and they were weeping. A few days later, the group would come across two Native American guides that refused to eat the human flesh and they were starving to death. William Foster would shoot them and say that this was the only way that the rest of the group could survive was by consuming them. A few days after that, the group would stumble upon a Native American village that would offer them food and provisions. This was the end of their journey. They had left their camp 33 days ago. They had 17, and then the two turned back, so they had 15, and only seven made it to the village. By this time, it's mid-January, and the people back at the camps in the mountains are still starving and freezing to death. They're living off of ox hides, which they had used as rugs and roofing, and what they've been doing is boiling it down to this glue-like substance that's been sustaining them. They're trying to pull all the nutrition they can out of anything they can. They were boiling the bones of these animals so much that the bones were becoming brittle and falling apart in their mouths as they tried to suck the nutrients out of them. The groups were still trying to hang on. By mid-February, relief groups had started to make their way into the mountains. February 19th, the first relief group makes it to their camp. One of the members in the relief group recalls seeing a woman come out of the snow and say, are you men from California? or do you come from heaven? When the relief parties get there, the people are so malnourished and weak, they can't just walk out of the mountains. Some of them have to be carried, some of them have to build the strength to get out. So this is gonna take more than one relief effort. Many of the people who would be stuck there between relief groups would resort to cannibalism in order to survive. George was very sick due to his injury in his hand and he told his wife Tamsin, to go with the relief groups and leave him, but she said she wouldn't leave his side. Towards the end of March, that's when George would succumb to his wounds 
and Tamsin would leave his body and attempt to make it to the other group. Tamsin didn't make it, but nobody knows if she starved or froze, or perhaps Louis Kesselberg murdered her. On April 17th, the final relief party would make it to the cabins and find Louis Kesselberg as the only survivor surrounded by half-eaten corpses. They said they found in a pot human liver and human lungs. Louis Kesselberg, this guy was a real piece of work. Even before the cannibalism and suggesting to hang James Reed, he had been known as a wife beater among the entire camp. General Stephen Watts Kearney would come back to that camp and call it the cannibal camp. He would take the bodies that were half eaten and still laying around and he would bury them and he would burn the cabins. He's probably trying to erase this horrible memory from the earth. If you look at the long list of people here, you can see those that survived and those that perished, but I like to know that they've been commemorated and that they did not do this all in vain. Overall, 81 people would be trapped in those mountains for that horrific long winter. 45 of those people would make it out alive. 21 of the 36 that didn't make it were either fully or partially cannibalized. Man, this is such a horrible story in American history. It's just, it's so hard to put yourself in that situation of life and death and trying to figure out what you would do. I pray that none of us ever have to be put in that spot where we have to decide what we're willing to do to survive. I'm not gonna cast judgment on the people who had to live through this horrific ordeal. Thank you all for watching the story of the Donner Party. If there's any other stories of survival that you want me to look into, leave them down in the comment section and I'll be sure to investigate them. Thank you all and I appreciate you all so much.